Welcome, everyone, to this month's Spirituality and Health Seminar. Uh, I am so delighted to be able to introduce to you Michelle Pierce. I've known Michelle for almost 20 years, and it's uh, she's been such a wonderful colleague for so many years. She was at Duke with me, and we did a lot of research together, and um, so it's it's great to have her give a seminar. So she's going to talk about spiritual competency training in mental health. So Michelle is professor and program director for integrative health and wellness at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and is adjunct faculty in psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Duke University Medical Center. She's a clinical psychologist and established researcher who specializes in the intersection between religion, spirituality, coping, and health. She has served as a PI or co-PI on a number of uh, externally funded projects, including uh, leading the John Templeton Foundation's funded studies de demonstrating feasibility and effectiveness of an online spiritual competency training program for increasing mental health clinicians and graduate students' religious and spiritual competencies. She has authored or co-authored several books on the role of religion slash spirituality in mental health, including Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Christians with Depression, a practical tool-based primer, and that's a really good one, for any of you who, uh, you know, are interested in using CBT, spiritually integrated CPT for treatment of depression, particularly for Christians, um, that's a great one. And also, religion and recovery from PTSD with me. And also, finally, Night Bloomers, 12 Principles for Thriving in Adversity. And that's another good one. You can get these books on Amazon. So before um, I take up any of, more of Michelle's time, Michelle, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. It is an honor to be with you and with all of you. Let me see if I can share my slides here. All right. You all can see that. You can hear me okay. Yes. Good stuff. Well, let's get started. So as Dr. Koenig said, I want to share with you today about spiritual competency training in mental health. So just a shout out to my fellow investigators. Uh, Joe Courier was the PI on the one of our grants. Ken Pargament was the PI on the first one. Um, and then some of our consultants here at UMB. And also, obviously, a huge thank you to the John Templeton Foundation for funding our two studies. So we'll talk about what is spiritual competency and why do we need it in mental health care. Then I'll get into the nuts and bolts of the program that we developed and the findings from our empirical studies. And I'll share with you, for those of you, especially that are mental health providers, 10 tips for integrating spirituality into psychotherapy, and then end with some resources if you're interested. So first, I wanna begin by presenting some hypothetical situations to you. So I want you to imagine what you would do, what you would say if your client said to you the following things. So they might say, I feel like God has abandoned me. If God is all powerful, why isn't he making things better? Or I'm a Christian and my parents say, if I marry a Muslim, they'll disown me. Or a third client says, I've been hearing my husband's voice every day since he died last month. Am I going crazy? So if you're a mental health provider, I want you to imagine, would I feel comfortable engaging in these conversations with these clients? How confident am I that I could help them? And have I received any training specifically in working with religion and spirituality and mental health? My hunch is that if you are a mental health provider, that you are most likely to answer no to those questions. Now, the fact that you're in this special group with Dr. Koenig, you're probably part of the minority that would say yes to some of those. 
Um, however, it's not just our client's religion and spirituality that comes up in the therapy room. It's also our own. So I want you to ask yourself, have I ever thought about how my own religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs impact treatment? What do I do if I work with clients that are of a different faith than myself? Do I know how to distinguish between psychopathology and what might be normative, but sort of out of the ordinary or unfamiliar spiritual experiences? In this country, I think in particular, we are socialized to think that talking about religion, politics, sex, are, they're taboo. They're too controversial. We don't talk about them. And the problem is that not only do we not talk about them at parties, we also don't talk about them in the clinical sessions with our clients. And we don't talk about them in our training programs. And the, the problem with that is that we're not providing the kind of care that our clients potentially need. So back in 2017, my research team and myself wanted to help change this problem. And so I want to tell you about the training program that we came up with to help change the way that we engage with clients around their religion, spirituality, and mental health. So let's start out with what is spiritual competency and why do we need it? So the goal of professional mental health training programs is to graduate clinicians that are ready to provide ethical and effective clinical care. That's the, the outcome of the, however many years you're in graduate school is to be this competent provider in these different areas. And one of those areas is multiculturalism. And an aspect of multiculturalism is spirituality and religion. So you might think of spiritual and religious diversity, its intersectionality, how it impacts clinical outcomes, um, clinical care, our biases, all of that as spiritual and religious diversity. And so we as a multiculturally competent practitioner need to be competent in this area. And we've defined in the literature spiritual competency as a form of cultural competence that deals with spirituality and religion, specifically clients. That's really key there, not therapists, but the clients individually constructed spiritual worldviews. And we typically see competency as being composed of three things, attitudes, knowledge, and skills. So some of you may know of, of Cassandra Beaton. She's written some books on spiritual competency, she has some seminal papers on sort of the 16 different types of competencies that she thought that um, her and her focus groups were psychologists that they should have in terms of attitudes, knowledge, and skills. And we took that and we applied it in our program across all mental health disciplines. But I wanted to just give you a sense of what I mean when I'm talking about these competencies. So for instance, for an attitude, we can substitute psychologists for mental health providers for demonstrating empathy, respect, appreciation for clients from diverse spiritual, religious, or secular backgrounds and affiliations. So that would be one kind of attitude in this area. Knowledge might be a mental health provider knows that many diverse forms of religion and spirituality exist, and they know how to explore that, what's important to their clients. And a skill, for example, is I'm able to conduct an empathetic and effective psychotherapy with clients of all different religious and spiritual backgrounds. So why is spiritually integrated mental health care so necessary? I think there's a number of different reasons. First, as you all know on this call, spirituality is a resource to many people as you go through your daily life, and especially as you're going through something difficult in life, a challenge or a stressor or a mental health issue. We also know from research that many clients want their spirituality to be integrated into treatment. There are some clients that even say in, in studies that if my therapist integrates my religion or my spirituality, I see them as more competent. I, I like them more and I'm, I'm getting sort of more out of, out of therapy. We also know from, the, from research that integrating spirituality can improve clinical outcomes, depression, anxiety, trauma, sort of across the board, this can be really helpful. The flip side to that is that there are some forms of spirituality and religion that can exacerbate mental health problems. So an effective therapist understands that religion and spirituality can be both a resource or for some, it can be a struggle. And for, for some clients, it's both at the same time. I've certainly worked with clients where religion is the most important thing in their life and it's something that they're relying on, but it's also an area that they're having a lot of struggle and pain within it. So we're dealing with both at the same time. The other reason why 
this uh, integrated care is so important is that we have ethical and professional mandates from our licensing and accreditation boards for being a multiculturally competent practitioner. And that includes in most of the wording across mental health disciplines, spirituality, um, and including our accrediting boards for training programs. So we're being told and expected that when we graduate, we can do this. Now here's the issue. Graduate and postgraduate training programs across mental health disciplines in this nation generally do not formally address religion or spirituality in their coursework or their clinical training. One of the most recent studies showed that 25% of clinical psych programs had a course in this area and 30% in social work programs. So that's pretty low. So we are not addressing this issue, meaning we're not graduating students that are now practitioners out there with the skills, the attitudes, knowledge, and, and skills to be able to help their clients for whom this is important. So we've got this training gap that my team and I started to really recognize back in 2016-17 that on one side of the street we've got lack of graduate training, lack of professional training, current competency levels of engagement, which are pretty low with our clients. And as you all know, if we don't feel confident, we don't feel confident in something, we're, we're not gonna do it. On the other side of the street, we've got practice realities, what our clients want, what the literature is telling us is important in terms of clinical outcomes. And then these ethical mandates from our boards and for our schools. So we wanted to know, can we bridge this training gap? And, and what would we need to do to be able to make it so that our practitioners that are out there have the attitudes, knowledge, and skills to be able to work with their clients around religious and spiritual issues. So that led to our first study, uh, which we call the Spiritual Competency Training Program in Mental Health. You'll hear me call it SCTMH for short, since that is a mouthful. Um, and this study was funded back in 2018 by the John Templeton Foundation. Um, this one was led by Dr. Ken Pargamon. We had three different sub-projects, so I was in charge of this particular part of the grant where we developed an online course, and this was designed for mental health providers that were out there already practicing. It was designed to be multidisciplinary, so whether you're a social worker or a counselor or a marriage and family, therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, or across the board, this course was for you. We designed it to be basic competency. So we're not trying to make anyone an expert in this area, just basic competency to work with your religious and spiritual clients. We used content that was empirically based. So we looked at the best books out there, journal, journal articles and such, and, and made videos. So there's several videos in each of the eight modules. There's text that you read, there's activities that you would do, self-reflection questions. So really trying to use adult learning instructional methods in our course. I don't know if you've heard of the edX platform. It's a learning platform. So that's where the online course is housed. It takes about eight to 10 hours to complete these eight modules. And we were evaluating changes in measures, seven different measures of attitudes, knowledge, and skills before and after taking the program. And in our study, we gave folks four weeks to complete the program. And we ended up recruiting 169 mental health providers. So just to give you a sense of the, the content, we started module one, just an introduction to this area, orientation to what is spiritual, the integrated care, and then understanding spirituality. And so here we have a little overview of some major world re religions, but also this is a chance for practitioners to think about and reflect on their own spiritual and religious background. How does this change? What biases might I have? And then we move into guiding principles. When you're thinking about this area of work, what are some things that I should be sort of have in the front of my mind when I'm working with clients? The fourth module, we get into helping someone distinguish between helpful and harmful types of spirituality. The fifth module is all about assessing spirituality. How do I get the question sort of out of my mouth in terms of assessing both in the initial interview and then as I go through treatment with someone? The sixth module is how to mobilize, how to use spiritual resources, if that's appropriate or helpful for your client. The seventh is how to assess and address spiritual problems, if that's relevant. And then the eighth was putting it all together in some future directions for this work. Uh, and just, I think, a, a note before I talk about the sample, um, I think it's important to say that this is not a training program on theology. You know, we're not trying to make practitioners spiritual experts 
We're also not prioritizing one worldview above another. So this is not, for instance, a, a course to learn to work with Christian clients. You know, this is across the board. So we've got examples and case studies with people who have for what they say, no religious or spiritual beliefs, like agnostic or atheist or secular or across the board. So that was important to us. I think the other thing to mention is that we're not privileging this area of diversity over other areas of diversity. So age, sex, gender, those sorts of things are equally important. But we did find in the literature in graduate schools of all the areas of diversity that get the least amount of teaching time is religion and spirituality. So we felt that there really was this need to make it a little more prominent. So here's our sample um, for this first study of 169 mental health providers. You can see primarily female, um, primarily Caucasian. Um, just to note here in terms of disciplines, we had, I think, more psychologists because our team was made up of psychologists that so were probably more well-connected in that world and have more um, listservs for psychologists. That's not the state of things across the nation. Um, I think we have mostly social workers and professional counselors and psychologists might be third on that list. Um, and then just to call out, 15% um, say very religious versus 43% very spiritual. Um, that's consistent with the literature as well. And most didn't have any prior training. So what did we find? And I will show you the measures for the next study. We had seven measures for attitudes, knowledge, and skills, and everything went in the direction that we had hoped for. So that means from pre to post, we had a positive significant increase in scores across these seven measures showing that participating in the course did increase your attitudes, knowledge, and skills for spiritually integrated care. So that's exactly what we were hoping for. Some more of our data showed that the practitioners felt this was helpful. They felt it was relevant to their clinical work. They were satisfied with the training program. Most would recommend it to their colleagues. Um, we were delighted that they found the online learning format easy to use. So this was before COVID. I remember having a conversation with Ken Pargament. He and I are, are both introverts. And the idea of traveling around the nation and giving in-person lectures <laughs> to train all these practitioners was, was not really appealing to either of us. Uh, so we decided to use it online. And then, of course, COVID happened. And this turned out to be a really good decision for us. A little bit of the qualitative feedback. Um, you know, I found it informative. I saw that religion and spirituality could be integrated without it being seen as conversion. I mean, that's important. You know, sometimes when people think we're doing this work that they are about evangelizing and we're not, this is all about integrating your client's religion or spirituality into their treatment, not to the therapist. And then, you know, comments like it increased my comfort level, increased my therapeutic confidence in how to do this. Again, everything that we were hoping to see. So we sat back with the team, you know, the end of 2019 and thought, well, why are we waiting? You know, we, we, this program seems to work and, but we're getting it out to practitioners after they're already out there sort of in practice working with these clients. Why don't we get it to them sooner? You know, why don't we get this to folks when they're still going through graduate training? And so that was our, our next thought. Um, and we asked ourselves, you know, why, why isn't this in graduate training already? And some of the main reasons that sort of come top of mind is it's hard to change curriculum. So for those of you on the call that are educators, you know how hard it is to get another course into your curriculum, especially when you have accreditation standards that you have to meet. The other fact was that faculty were saying, well, we're not experts. You know, us on the call, many of us maybe are experts in this area, but across the nation in graduate schools, most people are not experts in religion and spirituality and mental health. So they weren't feeling competent themselves to be able to train or to supervise students. Some of the other comments that came up when we were asking faculty, you know, what's getting in the way with this? Um, there was some discomfort of what if I start to prioritize a certain worldview over another? You know, what if I upset secular students that maybe had painful experiences? with organized religion in the past? Or what if I inadvertently perpetrate um, oppression against historic, historically marginalized groups? You know, so it became apparent to us that we really needed a sensitive and informed manner of going about this, that we needed to provide faculty both the, the what to teach and the how to teach, and to do that, in, again, in, in a sensitive way. The other thing as we thought through, you know, how are we going to do this? The, the first thought we had, well, well, we'll make a course. We'll design the whole course and we'll provide that to faculty members and they can get that in their curriculum. And we could even pay them to do that through the grant funding. And 
as we explored that, again, it just seemed too challenging, too much of a hurdle to ask a program to insert a whole new course, because what was going to happen, this would be an elective course. So now we're not reaching the whole student body, we're, we're reaching just a small select group of students that want to have this kind of training. And we felt it was really important, like other areas of diversity, that all students are exposed to this material. So we used the integrative approach, which meant that we came up with curriculum and then asked faculty to integrate it into their existing required clinical courses, which means all students in their programs are going to have access to it. And this is what we do in other areas of diversity. So when you think about gender, sexuality, age, we're not just having a course on it, we're infusing it across the curriculum. So we wanted to have the same model for this. So that's when we applied to the John Templeton Foundation again. And um, if you know anything about this foundation, they have very, very lofty goals. <laughs> so they came back to us and said, um, you know, 25, I think it was 25 years ago at that point, they had funded some researchers in medicine. Um, I think Dr. Koenig was probably part of this and said to them, we want you to change how training is done in medical schools because they weren't getting this training in religion and health uh, in medical schools. And now most medical schools to some degree, some more than others are teaching this material, religion and health. And so Templeton said to us, we want you to do the same thing in mental health. You're running behind <laughs> medical schools. We want to catch up. Um, cause a sea change in how training is done for mental health providers and mental health students. So that's what we did. And you can see sort of the long-term goal. We had four different sub-projects. I led the first one. So that's what I'll share with you today. Uh, and that's where we took uh, the course that I just explained to you and made it into um, a hybrid course for graduate students. So our challenge, no small challenge, was to significantly improve graduate students' basic attitudes, knowledge, and skills for attending to people's or clients' spirituality or religious faith. And how were we going to do that? We're going to enhance and integrate that curriculum that I just shared with you, the online course, into one of the required clinical courses. We decided that we would make this more than just the online course. However, we decided to make it hybrid, a hybrid curriculum. So we took the online program and we added a few things to it. So we enhanced it. I wrote some scripts, hired some actors, and they acted out some cases for us, some case scenarios, and then we would critique it. Here's what the therapist did well. Here's what they didn't do so well. Here's what you could do differently. And then some clinical practice applications. So at the end of each module, you guys learned this, you know, this week, go try this with your clients. So we used the online course, and then we added some in-class activities. So I wrote an instructor guidebook and I provided, here are the questions that you can ask in each of your classes. So that, you know, for six class discussions, you're talking about, you know, the, the modules and things you're learning for 30 minutes. In two classes, we prepared for them role plays. So I actually wrote out the case study. Here's what you can do as a therapist. Here's what you can do as a client. And the idea was just to get those students practicing, saying these skills, saying these words, you know, asking these questions out loud. So that's what we provided to faculty members. And the idea was we wanted to choose faculty members across the nations who were not experts in this, right? Because one of the barriers is the faculty were saying, we're not experts, we can't teach this. And we wanted to be able to prove we can take someone who's not an expert in this area, provide them with curriculum so that they are functioning more as a facilitator. So Dr. Parman and I, we did the videos on the, the online course, and we use it as a flipped classroom. So if you're not familiar with that term, it means students go out and sort of do the work, do the learning before they come to class, meaning they would go and watch a module or two, listen to Ken and I speak, read some of the text, and then they come to class and they're using the class time to have the discussions, to apply it to their cases, to do the role plays. And that's where the learning. So the, uh, an instructor can know nothing about this area, but they can facilitate the application or facilitate the discussions. So just to walk you through quickly the methodology, we recruited faculty, uh, 20 faculty across different accredited programs uh, from psychology, social work, and counseling. And we trained them how to teach this. So meant, that meant they went through the SCTMH course themselves, and then they did a half day online training program with us. And then they went off and replaced 15% of their course with our material. They could choose any 15%, however they wanted to do it. 
There was a final case study in the program, in the online program, and that was to be worth 15% of those students' final grade. Otherwise, you know, they could run their, their class however they liked. Then we asked them to implement this. So every instructor was asked to teach this the spring of 2023. Um, and so they it was a little creative because some of the, the instructors who applied to do this with us um, weren't necessarily teaching the courses they would have ideally chosen to integrate the material into, um, but everyone was was creative and they, they figured that out. As I mentioned, they were facilitators and not experts that, because they used that flipped classroom approach and followed the instructor guidebook. Uh, it was interesting to me, of course, when you run a research study, you have to be very careful to follow the protocol exactly. We couldn't have you know, one instructor in Massachusetts doing something different than an instructor in Kansas, for example, everyone had to do the same thing. Um, and I was wondering if 30 minutes for discussion was going to feel too long for students. Uh, across the board, we got feedback from faculty and students that they wished that we had given them much longer than 30 minutes. Um, so now that we're not part of a research study, of course, folks can have as long of discussions as they want. For evaluation, we used a waitlist control design. So that means that each student functioned as their own control. So the course was divided into 12 weeks. The first six weeks was our control condition. And we asked faculty not to talk about religion and spirituality. And if, if possible, if a student is asking questions about this, kind of please defer until week seven to, 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 to 12. Um, so between one and six, no curriculum between seven and 12, they taught the SCTMH curriculum. There were assessments at baseline, so that first week that they're in class, at the end of week six, that's the end of the control period, and the end of week 12, which is the end of the intervention period. We had hoped, kind of crossed our fingers that we were gonna get 200 students. We ended up with 309, so we were with that, we were then a little nervous that we wouldn't have enough money to pay them, um, which may have been one of the reasons why we got 309, because we offered some, some payment for them. Now, just to mention that all students in all of these courses across these 20 institutions had to participate in the SCTMH curriculum. They had to watch the online programming. They had to engage in the discussions. They had to do the final case study because it was worth 15% of their grade. What they did not have to do, because you can't require this of students, is to participate in the research. And so they did not have to fill out those three questionnaires. However, 88% of students agreed to fill out the, the questionnaires. And then we had an 87% retention rate, which means across all three surveys, 87% of the students filled out all three, which is kind of unheard of in social science research. So we were thrilled with that. So we would feel very confident with our findings. So our hypothesis was just as with the mental health providers, we expected that scores on the measures of the attitudes, knowledge, and skills were going to increase from before to after that six week period where they got the training and not during the first six weeks where they didn't get any. And then that it would be a feasible, helpful, and relevant way to train students in spiritual competencies. So just an overview of the measures that we used. So the Oxhandler measure, I never know if she says it, Recipus. <laughs> we always pronounce it wrong, and it's, it's kind of a running joke in our team, but here's a long form of the name, uh, measured attitudes and skills. We developed a questionnaire for our first study called the Spiritual Competency Questionnaire, looked at attitudes, skills, and subjective knowledge. I think one of the strengths of our study is that we didn't just measure subjective knowledge, which is the student says to you, yes, I know more than I did before. We actually had objective knowledge questionnaires. We worked hard on that to have three parallel forms at each time so that we could kind of quiz them and see, yes, indeed, their knowledge is changing over time. Um, some process assessment data, and then they had their final case study grade. Um, here's our participants. So we had 309 students, again, mostly female, mostly Caucasian. You can see the discipline is higher here, and this, this more uh, accurately represents what we see uh, across the nation in terms of disciplines. Um, religion, you can see there's a higher amount for none here um, than there was in the general population with the mental health providers. And same findings, lower, very religious versus very spiritual. 
I thought this would be the easiest way to show you all the results um, in the graph. And so I'll share between time one and time two, that's our control period, zero to six weeks. We were not talking about religion, spirituality then. All of those lines show no significant change, except the one line, which is self-efficacy. And we puzzled over this for a while because that's a significant decrease. And we think this is perhaps showing cultural humility, where a student starts a course and says, yeah, I know, I know a lot about this. And they're set, they go several weeks in, they're like, oh, actually, no, I, I don't know much about this at all. And so the score went down. Between time two and time three, where we had the intervention, all of these lines represent a positive statistical change. So an increase in scores, which is exactly, again, what we would hope to see and what we saw with the providers. If you're a numbers person, Instead of a graph person, this slide shows exactly the same thing with our p-values. In terms of preferences and feedback, um, students said it was helpful, it was relevant, they were satisfied with the training materials, and we were delighted with this. Almost 100% said they envisioned using spiritually integrated therapy techniques with their clients, and that, that was the whole point of this, right? Um, I love this first quote. <laughs> I was surprised that this opened my mind because I really hate religion more than most things in life. But honestly, everyone has a right to their beliefs and to be an ethical social worker. I need to be okay talking with my clients about their religion. That's great. Before the training, I would never explore this topic. <laughs> Excuse me, after this training, although there's still a lot I need to learn and do, I feel comfortable enough to bring it up and to integrate it as effectively as I can. So really pleased with the qualitative data. This interesting just got published last Monday. <laughs> so this is our reference and close one. And then I want to end. So that sort of wraps up the, the course. And just to give you an update, we our team, our research team yesterday, uh, another grant application to the Templeton Foundation. Our hope is to take this global next. Um, so we're going to take a year if we get funded and see if we can find teams across the world that will culturally adapt the program so that it works for providers in their countries. It's really important to us that this doesn't feel like a, a U.S. imported product that we just plop in another country and change the language and think that it's going to work. So I recognize that we have a we need to have a lot of cultural humility and have a lot of work ahead of us to figure out how could this potentially help with spiritual competency training for providers in other countries? But I think that's a really exciting um, area of research ahead of us. So I want to end with 10 tips if you are a provider for how to integrate spirituality into psychotherapy. And a big thank you to my partner here, Dr. Kenneth Pargament. Uh, he came up with these and we wrote a, a short chapter on this this summer. So the first one is <clears throat> to take a deep breath. So if you are not used to broaching religion and spirituality and therapy, I recognize that this could feel daunting. And I just want to remind you that this is not rocket science. You don't have to be a theologian or a spiritual expert to do this. I want to remind you that you have a lot of these clinical skills already to talk to people about sensitive and important and sacred matters and to re rely on the skills that you do already have. So you are not starting from scratch. The second one is to be self-aware. <clears throat> I think it's really important to be aware of how your experience with religion and spirituality and how that's changed over the years, what biases you might have, <clears throat> so that you are you are we're never bias free. Right? You're just gonna you're still gonna bring that into the therapy room, but you can be aware of how that might impact you and your work. And that's why module two is all about. Uh, in the program, all about looking at your spiritual history and looking at your biases. Tip three is to give yourself permission to raise these issues in psychotherapy. So remember all the studies, Dr. Her uh, Dr. Koenig does such a, a good job um, helping us to bring awareness of all the studies that have been published in this area. He's written many, many big handbooks on this. If you haven't already got one, do get one. Um, because it gives all the evidence for us to be able to say, yes, this is really important. This has an impact on health and on mental health. So we should, we should be bringing this up. And we also know from surveys of our clients that they are asking us, they're saying, we want you to bring this up. Um, Dr. Oxhandler has done some work showing that clients are more likely to wait for us 
to bring that up as therapists. And I think that probably has a lot to do about the taboo that we have in our society around religion and spirituality. So remember that it, just because a client doesn't bring it up doesn't mean it's not important to them. I had a client once when I was still working at Duke and she came in and for our intake, as I do with all clients, I asked her, you know, is religion or spirituality important to you? Is it part of your life? And she said, no, it's not part of my life. And uh, I just said, you know, if, if it was, I'm very comfortable talking about that with you in therapy. And she was not. Um, so I, that was it, right? That's all I, I needed to say. I think it was three sessions later, she came in and she sat down. The first thing she said to me was, I want you to know that religion is the most important thing in my life. And I'm really struggling with God. And I think the reason I have all this chronic back pain is because God is punishing me. And if you had not asked me in my first in, in our first session together, I never would have brought it up because I don't feel comfortable talking about that in therapy. But I, since you did, I'm bringing it up here. And then the rest of our time together, I think we spent a year together, was all about religion and depression and how they intersected. So I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten how just by asking that one question in the intake and gave that client permission to talk about what later turned out to be the most important thing in her life. Tip four is to remember that religion and spiritual issues should be integrated rather than set apart from psychotherapy. So I hope that what you're hearing from me is not a different way, you know, a different type of therapy that we're doing, that this is just part of therapy, just the way that you might ask someone how issues of aging or race are related to the, the issues that they're bringing in or they're functioning in the world. We're integrating this into psychotherapy. So as I shared in that last example, in my intake, I'm asking about religion and spirituality. It's not a separate intake. It's just part of the questions that I ask in every intake. Tip five is to remember that you are discussing sacred matters with your clients. So it needs to be handled, you know, with sensitivity and care and remembering that they may not be comfortable talking about these things right off the bat with you. That client wasn't, right? Took her three or four sessions in to be able to, to talk to me about it. So to have some sensitivity that it may take clients a little more time to open up to you about these issues. Tip six is to tailor your religious and spiritual resources to client specific needs, preferences, and problems. So we're not offering a generic religion could help you, you know, or even like meditation could help you. Right? We're thinking about what is it exactly that they're bringing into our session? What problems was our treatment plan? And how do I specifically gear a spiritual resource for what they're going through. So for example, if a client is going through complicated grief, maybe you're thinking about a religious or a spiritual ritual that would help them through that for processing the loss and, and moving forward. Tip seven is to remind your client that it takes time to read the benefits from religious and spiritual resources. Sometimes they have unrealistic expectations. Let's go back to the example of meditation. You teach the meditation in a session, they come back next week and Sorry, doc, meditation doesn't work for me. You know, how often, how often did you practice? Well, I tried it one night for 10 minutes, right? I still feel as bad as I felt the week before. Well, you have to kind of remind people, like these are practices. They're called super spiritual practices for a reason because they take practice, you know, discipline and practice. Tip eight is to be ready to discuss barriers to integrating religious and spiritual resources in psychotherapy. So like any other resource or tool or skill that you might be giving a client, it makes sense that they're going to run into barriers or issues. And so doing some, your same problem solving skills around that to help them address the barriers that might get in the way of those. Tip eight is to work within your own professional and personal boundaries. So as I said before, this is not to make you a spiritual expert or a theologian, a spiritual care expert. I bet we have many of the, many of you on the call. That is what you do and that's what you're trained to do. If you're a mental health provider, that's not necessarily what we're we're aiming for. So if you reach you know, the, the boundary of your competence, then there are many professionals out there that you can refer to, consult with, get supervision from. And tip 10, have some additional resources on hand for clients that are interested in learning more. We are so privileged to be in you know, 2024 with so many resources out there now. Um, this wasn't the same, I'm sure, when um, Dr. Koenig started his career. It wasn't even done the same when I started my career. Um, and he's done such a fabulous job for us. I don't know if, he's still, if you're still putting out those newsletters, Dr. Koenig, but that's been a really wonderful way for us to know of some of the the 
the latest and greatest resources that are out there. Um, so just be prepared if you're talking about this in your in your sessions with clients, so they may want other resources. So I promised you at the end, I would provide some the resources for you on spiritual competency if you're interested. So if you're a provider, we have the online training program up on edX. If you want continuing education credits, you can get six of them for $89. So that's across mental health disciplines. Um, if you are an educator or a graduate student or postdoc or trainee, all of our curriculum materials that we use in that second study are freely available. So here's the website. Um, Dr. Coney is going to make my slides available afterwards, so don't feel like you have to write down this long uh, website address, but they're available here. And if you're looking for how do I access the online training program through for the educators and graduate students, you're going to click on the instructor guidebook. That's the Word document. And I think it's on like page two or three are the instructions for how to access for free the online training program. We've published a few things. There's one more coming out hopefully this fall on the study, actually two more that should be coming out. So this is on both for the mental health providers and for our graduate students, if you're interested in looking at those. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I think we probably have some time for questions and answers. Michelle, thank you for a great presentation. You're welcome. And uh, we do have some time. We have 15, about 15 uh, to 20 minutes that participants can unmute themselves and ask uh, Michelle a question. So please do so. There's probably nobody in the world who is, is as knowledgeable as Michelle is on spiritually integrated therapy. So go ahead and uh, raise your hand and ask your questions. Unmute yourself and... Hi, Michelle. Oh. Hi there. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I just wanted to say that I was a psychiatry resident when you um, did the initial study, the very first one, and I was one of the participants and I'm like visibly Muslim. So I'm probably the only Muslim participant that was there because I saw there was one person Muslim or so maybe there were two Muslim participants. But I just want to add that it was so lovely to do that oh, training. I had nothing like that during my psychiatry residency, but we tried to do something after, after I got that training. We tried to do something something in our curriculum of our own. Uh, but I just really appreciate it. It has stayed with me all these years and um, would love to collaborate with you in the future um, if something, if I want to like introduce this elsewhere. Absolutely. That, that is so heartwarming. I promise you, I did not plant her in the audience. <laughs> that was uh, so yeah, lovely. Yeah, I just me. joined spontaneously. <laughs> lovely. Thank you so much for sharing. Stan, you're up next. Uh, okay. Um, one of the, well, first of all, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, basically, I'm an overeducated disc jockey. All right, <laughs> we go from there. And uh, I've been a business performance coach for a number of years. Here's what I've done. I just want to run it by you. Is that in our latest project? I just when I re meeting with a class or a thing. I've actually said, you know, here are the seven things that I believe. You know, you don't have to believe them, but I want you to know my name is Stan. I'm an old man. And these are the seven things I believe from my experience. And then I just go through them. And uh, the one that has been the most striking, and I want to ask you a thought about just the whole idea of doing that, that self-disclosure right off the bat was when I used the quote by Teilhard de Chardin, which is, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And if that's true, it changes everything. Am I doing I something that. right or wrong? <laughs> I love that quote. So Stan, I will answer your question. I, th I feel it's different whether I'm talking to you as a clinician or an educator. Okay. So as a clinician, it's all about my client and what she or he believes, mm -hmm. right? So I'm never going into the session and saying, hey, here are the seven things important to me. I'm trying to get the seven <laughs> things that are really important to them. 
right? So that's as a clinician. As an educator, however, and we've added this to the course, I am very sort of upfront about outing myself, right? And Dr. Hargman did the same thing. So in our introduction to, hey, here's who we are, I'm, I'm Christian, I'm cisgender, I'm female, I'm right. So I'm kind of putting out there if you want to read into my value system, potential biases. Um, so as an educator, I'm more likely to do that. And a clinician, I'm not. Is that mm-hmm. helpful? That's helpful. That, you know. Great. Good. Thank you. Very good. Michelle, there are a bunch of different uh, comments in okay. the chat and uh, you don't need to read them. But okay. some of the people who made the comments might uh, unmute themselves and and ask their question or make their comment. Great, great idea. Hi, um, I'm Rachel from Virginia. Hi, I Rachel. Just, <clears throat> a great presentation. And um, I know that Euro- Erasmus has funded the European group to develop competencies, spiritual competencies. So... If, when you're going international, probably internationally, everybody needs the same competency, probably. I'm a nurse, so uh, that group has different professionals, social workers and mental health professionals. Just that, a thought. That's really helpful. Now, Rachel, would you mind emailing me that? We could be in touch. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Dale has his hand up. Dale, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks for the presentation and congrats on the publication of your uh, you. paper. Um, in your demographics, uh, in both the, your initial training uh, and research and then the second go around, you indicated a bullet point for Christians and then two or three below you indicated Catholics. Mm-hmm. That would suggest that there's a difference between a Catholic and a Christian, and I don't believe that's the case at all. Could you tell me why you listed Catholics separate than Christian? Yeah, good point. It seems to be the uh, the main practice in the research is to separate it. There are there are folks that would see would classify themselves as Catholic but not Christian, or Christian but not Catholic. So in order to be sort of most inclusive, we had to give folks an opportunity to choose the identity that they that fit best for them. Um, so that's why we've separated the categories. And Dr. Koenig, you may have some thoughts about that too and how it's done in the research. Yeah, Michelle, com- commonly one might say Protestant Christians, Catholic Christians, uh, that's a little, little bit uh, more common, but you know, that's... Uh, I think separating out the groups is certainly permissible, um, you know. So those are my thoughts. I think Meba is next on the line for her question. Thank you very much for a very good, uh, thoughtful, thought-provoking presentation. I'm uh, calling from South Africa. I uh, actually have a comment and uh, a question. Okay. The question is, what would be the difference between spiritual competence and cultural competence? Okay. And the, the comment is that, yeah, most of the therapy is, is we have that impression that it goes through the talk. That's why some would call it talking therapy. But actually, there are many things which are not said. And sometimes the clients, this site in my hospital, we call them users, might bring spiritual issues in a non-verbal way. So one has to be very careful and observant to pick it up and bring it up. Thanks again. I think that's a good point, Mamba. Um, so to your question about cultural versus spiritual competencies, when we think of culture, at least so how I've been trained, multicultural competence is a much broader term than spiritual competence. So spiritual competence would fit into cultural competence, but so would age and gender and sexuality and class and you guys should probably name some more of those, would fit under cultural competence. So again, spiritual competence is just a, a piece of the multicultural competence. 
Very good. Rabbi Joel Finkelstein, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure listening to you, and uh, I appreciate your, your work, especially as a chaplain. So um, I, a number of us commented on the chat that um, uh, while obviously chaplains appreciate, uh, particu particularly appreciate um, other mental health professionals uh, uh, develop their uh, spiritual competency to be able to assess that. Once you've assessed that, uh, we were kind of disappointed not to hear that, oh, we've assessed that. Oh, um, you know, if you're in a hospital setting, there are chaplains in that setting, obviously different if you're, if you're let's say, a, a, a therapist working out of a private office. But if you're in a hospital setting and there are chaplains, wouldn't that be a good opportunity to mm. allow the chaplain to make a referral and allow them to further explore that segment of their life? Absolutely, Rabbi. And that's about just a omission on my part. I think the way we think about it is that most of kind of what we're, the practitioners are reaching are in outpatient care. So they're on a, a therapy session in the clinic, um, but you're absolutely right. And if you are in a hospital setting, meeting with a chaplain for spiritual care is absolutely what should happen. And we do talk about in the course, there's a whole section on referral and consultation. So you can be in an outpatient, sex, uh, outpatient session and reach the level of your competency. And we need to be able to make a referral to someone like yourself. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. Good. Manny, you're up next. Uh, thank you, uh, Harold and uh, Michelle. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Michelle. I really uh, enjoyed it and learned a lot. I'm a Catholic. I must say that this is the first time I'm hearing that uh, Catholics uh, will not identify as Christians. I think that's that's not a. I don't think that's a correct statement, but that's not the forum for it. So Catholics are Christians. Period. Um, so and I, and I don't. I, I'm not aware of any Catholic that will not say it's not Christian. I'm just not aware of that. All my years of being a Catholic. Uh, but the question I had for you was the how you I, I noticed that in some of your slides you there was um, differentiation about those who consider themselves religious and spiritual. Um, how did you how did you define those two categories? Good question. And many we didn't. We let folks define it for themselves. So the question was just simply, do I consider myself a very a religious person? Or, is, or do I consider myself a spiritual person? Two different questions. So you could rate yourself on how religious I feel I am and how spiritual. And we purposefully did not define those terms for folks. Um, so myself, I would consider myself highly in both categories. I, I see them as very overlapping categories. That's not necessarily true of some of my peers who might consider themselves to be very spiritual, but not at all religious. So we let the person define that. Um, and it's interesting to hear some of you talk, I think, Dale, <clears throat> Dale, you were the one who brought it up to you and Manny about Catholic and Christian. And I wonder if it partly has to do with what part of the country, this country that you're in, if you're in the U.S., and what part of the world that you're in. Um, it's interesting, up here in the Northeast, I'm in Maryland, and there does seem to be a distinction between how people classify themselves. Um, but there was a time when I lived in North Carolina, and I think there was less of that distinction. So um, it's it's interesting for me, and it's also helping me think through, you know, when we do the global study, is having to really figure out, like, for that country, um, how are people defining themselves or classifying themselves? So, yeah, thanks for getting me thinking about these things. Okay. Martha, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi, Michelle. Um, thank you very much for your presentation today. And um, I, I must be in the very, very fortunate small percentage that actually had a course in social work school in the early 1990s wow. on um, spirituality and social work practice. And I am also dual credentialed. I'm an, an ordained Lutheran pastor for over 40 years and a mental health professional for 30 so um, one of the things that um, in, in looking, listening to your presentation and looking at the slides that, that impresses and that I would really hope and encourage for more exploration of is the female dominant self-identification mm -hmm. um, in, in the demographics. And also um, as other people have been talking about the mix um, in, in these big broad world religious really spiritual paths um, that there are so many nuances that in, in some ways the demographics almost become meaningless. Um, as a professional, um, 
I, I have been teaching very similar material based on my own foundational work back in the 90s in school and um, have been working um, you know, for decades to, to develop transdisciplinary approach to all of these issues. I applaud you for doing the hard work of the called mixed model studies to have the data for people like me that, that are not innately researchers mm -hmm. to back up what I have been doing and teaching for decades. So thank you very much for that. And, and I hope that you can deepen it and, and move it beyond um, the limitations of quantitative research uh, because they, they pigeonhole people in a way that I think you're trying to avoid um, mm -hmm. by framing all of this in, in terms of a, uh, a subset of cultural competency. But thank you very much. And thank well, you. Well, thank you, Martha. Like respond. honored, honored to meet you. And you have been boots on the ground for far longer than I have. So thank you for what you've done for the field. Thank you. If I may, I have a rather interesting story about that distinction. Um, years ago, when I was being trained at the BBC, I became friends with a, a gentleman from India. And it turned out that a, in our conversation, I would have very much said that, you know, you're a Christian. And he said, no, I am not a Christian. I am a Hindu, but I am a profound follower of Jesus. And I follow him and believe him. Everything he says is true, but I am a Hindu of the warrior caste. And every culture needs warriors. And that's who I am. And so, obviously, his fellow Christians in the Indian community were very upset with him. But uh, that distinction was very important to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mia, you have your hand up. Hi, yes, I am also a professional chaplain uh, working in a retirement community, and I love it. Um, some of what you have told us about today sounds very similar to some of the work that uh, chaplains would do in a clinical pastoral education setting. And I'm wondering if you have considered adding your curriculum to a CPE curriculum. Interesting. So we purposely didn't have sort of professional counselor, clinical CPE, I'll use that term, um, in our our inclusion group, because we felt that you all had even more than basic competency, you have advanced competency, right? So we were trying to reach the providers out there that didn't have any at all. So my thinking, and that's very kind of me, my thinking is we probably have a much more basic level of training than what you are providing in, in your programs with my hunch. Yeah, okay. Uh, you, Vasri, has her hand up. Yuvasri, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. I am Yuvasri yes. from south part of India. I am doing religious cognitive theory research. How can I get connected with you to increase my knowledge and experience, sir? Is that for you, Dr. Pony? Uh, could you repeat your question? Yuvasri, it's a little, little, I'm having a little trouble hearing. I don't know if Michelle can hear you better, but go ahead and unmute yourself. And we got that you're from she, India. I think she's asking for how to get connected and more resources. And one might be to get connected to your newsletter that has all of those different ways that she can get involved. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be um, contacting Dr. Koenig after this and requesting we put on the mailing list as a, as a start, at least. That's a great suggestion, Michelle. <laughs> great suggestion. Okay, Stanley, you're up next. Hi. Um, I, I taught the, I'm retired now, but I used to teach a course in spirituality and social work practice at uh, uh, University of Chicago's uh, School of Social Work there. And they had a we had a, a meeting with the doctoral candidates, the doctoral students, and the topic was about you know integrating this. And the students were very receptive. A lot of the faculty were very concerned about proselytizing. 
And what I told them is I said, you know, have I ever heard of proselytizing happen? Yes, I have heard of that. What I have often heard of as a clinician and a teacher is uh, clients who wish that someone would have raised that. My last therapist asked me who I slept with, but not who I prayed to, that kind of a response. And uh, I'm glad to, to hear that you're, you know, doing things so that people can at least get their foot in the water, even if they don't really want to develop and spend the time developing the competence that they can be a facilitator. So I appreciate the fact that you've got that going. Well, thank you. And thank you to you too, Stanley, for being boots on the ground. Appreciate that. Okay. Wonderful. Michelle, it's one o'clock. So I'm we're yeah. gonna have to um, you know, stop for for the afternoon. But thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for all of your questions. And, uh, you know, even some challenging questions, that's okay. That's all part of this. And we all learn from, from those questions. So thank you all for participating and we'll see you next.